friends. Welcome to another session of the Metacast Crypto Corner brought to you by Navic. I'm your host, Alex Decay, but you can call me Decay for short. And today I'm joined by Adam Hensel, CEO and founder of Battlebound, a Web3 gaming studio. Welcome to the Metacast, Adam. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, super excited to have you on. And so um, before I inevitably ask you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background and Battlebound as a studio, I've been told by the Novic devs that I need to introduce myself um, at least a couple episodes in a row since I'm a new voice for the audience. Um, to reiterate, uh, I am one of the uh, podcast hosts that's taking over for Nico, who used to host the podcast prior. He'll be continuing on his podcasting journey at FogDAO. Uh, I went right into games at an undergrad at Blizzard, and I spent some time working on the franchises there, Hearthstone, Diablo 4, Overwatch, StarCraft. Spent some time on the Activision Blizzard Partnerships team. I joined an indie studio named System Era Softworks. And then I also worked um, with some of the BitCraft guys on Web3 and Web2 game studio investing this past summer. Right now I'm at Stanford um, in my second year of business school. I'm the president of the gaming club. Um, my dominion stands at like 30 people. So it's we got a vibrant community. <laughs> and um, I'm also a, a Stanford Blockchain Club accelerator advisor and mentor. So that's about a little bit about me, um, but enough of that. Uh, you know, who are you, Adam? Uh, what What is, you know, why Web3? What's Battlebound up to? All right, yeah, excited to dig into all those things. Uh, my quick background, uh, I've been building games for about 12 years. Uh, I founded Battlebound about a year and a half ago uh, after leaving Riot Games. So my background's in technical art and game art. Uh, I spent four years at Riot working on League of Legends and building out Teamfight Tactics uh, before getting really excited about, uh, I guess, the Web3 space and, and NFTs and ownership uh, in games and what that means for players and how we build games. And so, uh, yeah, I got the itch to dive back into building uh, games with a small team and having high levels of ownership and creativity over the process and looking to, I mean, really revolutionize how we as game developers honor and treat our players uh, and build more meaningful meaningful relationships with them in the process. And so that was how Battlebound got started. And yeah. Awesome. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think uh, the Riot ethos, I think, is probably one of the best, you know, AAA studios that, that really values their community and they do that yeah. management really well. I'd actually love to ask you later on the podcast about what you think about doing that through the way that Riot's doing it right now versus doing it through Web3 and tokens, uh, yeah, totally. which maybe an interesting discussion. But um, before we kind of pivot to maybe the economy and, and governance of, of your game, uh, Evaverse, mm -hmm. um, would love to kind of just, you know, ask a little bit about the game, right? Um, Evaverse seems like it's a pay to own experience, um, but you know, what is the what is the moment to moment gameplay look like? What's the player doing? Um, just, you know, give a high level, you know, pitch of the pitch of the game. Sure. Yeah. So the Avaverse is a social multiplayer competitive gaming experience. So that's a comprised of a series of game modes. And each mode is designed to offer players sort of the best in class experience that is that are popular uh, or arising within like the Web3 space and give them ownership and utility uh, over the ex those experiences uh, underpinned by a collection of NFTs. But the game is also free to play. And so we are building for the largest audience possible. And we believe accessibility is an issue with uh, sort of the web three landscape of games and getting players on board. And the best way to solve that is to open up that uh, foundation for players to join. Uh, and so you don't need any NFTs. Uh, the game's currently on Steam. You can download and play, play for free. Uh, and right now we have uh, hoverboarding is like our main game mode. And so every gotcha. player is able to participate in those races. Uh, and if you have a uh, NFT hoverboard, they level up and they gain experience and they gain all kinds of different stats. And we have three different uh, moon bases uh, throughout the Avaverse, which you can, players can, can race against. And so we're building more modes uh, coming down the pipe. We have one called Cosmic Cup, which is a pet racing uh, battle type game that similar to, I guess, to like Fall Guys mixed with Twitch-based uh, kind of reactive uh, League of Legends style c combat uh, alongside and during the race. Uh, and each of these modes are meant to be uh, very fun and social, but also competitive uh, and, and give players the opportunity to, to really compete and, and strategize and play against each other in fun and creative ways. 
And so we're, as the game expands, we're going to be building out new modes. Uh, we've already begun pre-production on our third mode, which is more of a arena type shooter mode uh, that players will play while riding around their hoverboards. And so the idea is that as the game expands, uh, these different game modes will also uh, sort of coalesce together and ultimately we'll be handing over the tools to our players in our community to mix and match and create different rule sets and, and types of game modes within mm. the game uh, as they as they as those tools and building features come online. Got it. So essentially, Ibiverse is basically a world where you can play a lot of different types of competitive multiplayer games. Um, I took a look at uh, Ibiverse, and it kind of looks to me like an SSX Tricky, but in Web3. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'll do some tricks out there, um, get style points, etc. Um, totally. So I think that's sort of the idea. Um, so makes a lot of sense. Very exciting. I know there's a lot of um, battlers and racing games that Web3 have been, um, that Web3 has kind of been, been pursuing. In yeah. terms of the Web3 component though, so where does the blockchain really like link into your game, right? There's all of these types of games that have multiple, like multiple levels of blockchain uh, integration, mm -hmm. right? You know, to the yeah. furthest to the right, we've got our dark forest logic yeah. on chain. And then we've got like our web like 2.2s, which are like, this is the same game, but with NFTs. Where would you say um, Averse is currently on this spectrum? Yeah, so we're currently on, I'd say, more of the the latter spectrum that you described, because everything that we do is optimized from the experience of the players, and we want them to have a really smooth uh, and easy onboarding experience and get into the game and decide, like, hey, is this game fun? Do I love playing this? Uh, without having to jump through a lot of the friction that you would have to jump through when the entire game logic is on chain. And so what that means is we have NFTs, uh, players are able to trade them. Uh, most of them have been airdropped to them for free for just being part of our community. And as, you know, we did over a year ago, we did our initial avatar mint of our characters and, and we sold that out. And everything else has been about engaging and building alongside of our, of our players. And so the majority of the game right now is off chain. And that's how we've been able to actually stay and grow on Steam uh, and use that platform. Uh, but as the game matures and the, our team is now much larger, you know, we're 20 uh, developers now. Uh, we started this year as a, as a, as a team of two uh, that built most of the original Averse and the NFT collection. And so uh, we've been scaling and building a lot. And as we continue, uh, we're going to build more meaningful on-chain interactions uh, when the game does come off Steam uh, and we're able to, to uh, focus on those. But until then, uh, our primary focus is building a product and building a great game that players are going to love to play, uh, regardless of the rest of the on-chain or, or non-on-chain features. And so, um, yeah, we, we use a combination of techniques from storing the assets on-chain to a lot of the metadata off-chain so that, you know, you don't need to pay gas every race for your to gain experience or, or to level up or... Um, yeah, and so and we leverage the Polygon network uh, and are able to airdrop rewards and and provide meaningful interactions to players within the game, uh, and we'll continue to expand that out in the future. Gotcha. Um, and so yeah, I've got a, I've got a bunch of spouting questions from from that. The first is, it sounds like I don't have to buy an NFT to play, right? Yes. I can get it airdropped to me for free. How does that work? Um, if I'm you know if I'm a player, I don't know anything about Web three, right? You know, I need to get started in this game. Where do I go? Right. Yeah, I mean, you can just uh, go to the website, create an account. You'll use that account to log in when you download the game from Steam, and you can begin to play. There's a free avatar. Uh, there's a free hoverboard. Uh, and the pet racing mode that we're building called Cosmic Cup, there's going to be a free turtle. So literally everything you can do in the game uh, that you could do with an NFT, you can do as a free player. And so the free player progression uh, is uh, essential and a hugely important part of the vision and, and how we aim to onboard more players into the world of, of NFT ownership and, and gaming on chain over time. Got it. Got it. And then my next question is just, I'm surprised that you're on Steam, uh, you know, <laughs> back in November, 2021, you know, Steam banned blockchain games yeah. from their platform. So, you know, what happened there for you guys? Um, you know, when did you launch? Did you launch on Steam after that? And could you just sort of share maybe a little bit about your experience of trying to launch a Web3 game in a Web2 platform gated world? Um, where would you go after Steam, for example? Yeah, yeah it was tricky. Um, but no, we actually launched and were live and playable before that big announcement came out. Um, and we actually, when we uh, 
went to, to Greenlight and, and published the game. Steam came to us and said, hey, we actually don't allow uh, blockchain games or, or NFTs like this. And we said, okay, like, that's great. Uh, where I, just so you know, like, we don't like uh, write to the blockchain. Players aren't earning Bitcoin or Ether tokens within the game. Uh, you know, we just have like, basically we use it for game inventory. And they were cool with that. So and we're like, okay, great, cool. Like we we uh, we mm. released, and then you know, as we've been on Steam, we've had had a couple of conversations, and uh, we did move the wallet connecting feature to the website and out of out of the game because of that. Uh, but we've been in talks with Steam support, and you know, they are not entirely like against NFTs. They're against NFTs doing certain things within game, and they are totally cool with having a comparable like. Uh, blockchain light version of the game that's cross platform uh as long as uh, uh the steam version has feature parity with the with the on-chain version and so and that's how we've structured the game from the get-go uh, because we do want it to be accessible to as many players as possible and so we hit in that without really needing to make much pivots or or uh changes on that side Interesting. So your game will continue to stay on Steam, basically at infinite, or any yeah, plans Steam, to? We do have plans to take it off Steam. We are building our own Battlebound games launcher. Uh, mm-hmm. We have some other plans that we're having the works that we're not quite able to uh, speak to quite yet that we're really excited about. But the Battlebound games launcher is essentially like the backstop. Uh, no matter what or what like what platform rules, we know we can self publish through our own games launcher, and we're going to be building games in the future and so we have this technology in which we can support and build the products and the features that are are best for our ecosystem and our players got it what if on on your just just imagine like a dream world right like what would be the best solution do you guys think right now because i know that a lot of web3 studios are struggling with distribution i think that there is this is being tackled from a myriad of angles um you know i actually have a classmate that's not doing this for games but she's doing it for nft projects right it's Mm -hmm. like impossible to keep track of like the random nfts that you own and know like when nouns is updating blah 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 right so they need like a consolidated news feed um and so i think that's a very interesting strategy of right trying of aggregation right what would be like the dream tool if you were a developer right now would it be the steam of web3 would it be like a marketplace of integration right would it be that you have your own client i guess well it sounds like what you're what you're building but um just kind of maybe speak to that I mean, you said, I think you touched on some very interesting points, um, especially like the steam of Web3. Uh, and, you know, what we believe here at Battlebound uh, and what we're building towards the future where Web3 sort of fades into the background a bit. And so games are games. Uh, and so we're, we'd be able to release on Steam. We'd be able to release on the Epic Store. We'd be able to release on uh, Congregate or wherever, whatever that looks like, uh, wherever people, where the players are and they have a desire to play games. Uh, And so the web three element is really uh, a type of technology that empowers us to build really engaging and meaningful features in game. Uh, And then they can live alongside any other place or console where players love to play games. And so I guess to me, that's the dream situation. Got it. So you just ideally just love to release full blast shotgun everywhere, right? Um, Mobile, PC, we are, everything. Yeah, we are planning a mobile port. Everything that we build it was in Unity uh, for its cross-play and, and, and cross-platform functionality. And we're building with mobile in mind. And as we scale the team, yeah, we, we plan to have a, a cross-play launch of the Avaverse and all of our future titles as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, and so it sounds like basically the underlying crux of Avaverse is basically the ownership of your NFT and digital assets that are used in gameplay, the hoverboards, mm-hmm. the character units, right? Um, And what the grand vision is that players are going to be building their own rule sets, right? Perhaps their own maps um, Mm -hmm. and constructing these new modes naturally. And so I'm wondering how you're thinking about those people who are doing that work um, Mm -hmm. and any kind of like token economy alignment with a UGC component, like the UGC token component. Um, Mm -hmm. in the future, right? Um, Are you thinking about integrating and like launching a token like that uh, to kind of incentivize creators to create or more web two perspective, right? Creators love love of the game situation. 
You know, it's a combination of both. Uh, I think the token, we are we are aiming and planning to launch a token and we're actually going through the process of a, of a token raise uh, right now and, and, and having those conversations. Um, but the token is a great opportunity uh, to align in incentives across a number of parties, but also lends itself really well to incentivizing the community uh, to participate and contribute and create, uh, especially as it comes to the competitive gaming landscape, because you know players are able to vote with their time and effort and play the maps or the modes that you know they they love, and like that's what makes these modding communities so successful. And so, tokenizing that is a great incentive for builders uh, and ties everything together neatly under the umbrella of just the general game economy that we are also leveraging to you know reward competitive play and and great. Um, plays within the game and people that excel uh, at the at the modes and the and the game mechanics that that we build. Hmm. Got it. So so far, right now, something to consider, but not actually being not actively deployed in terms. Yeah, of- yeah. It's it's much uh, going to be much further down the road. Like the, our our approach is essentially like we as game developers. Uh, you know, I've been building games for a long time, and so we want to focus on finding that fun and building compelling game experiences that players are going to love playing and then hand that over to them to experience uh, within the guides of like, here are the tools and and here is how you can build on top of this strong foundation that we as a game studio have built in our products. Got it. And then in that, in that regard, right? Like how do you think about, um, and maybe this is speaking to the, to the riot discussion, I think one of the things that I think about a lot in games, right, is, and I remember, (laughs) I remember I was just chatting with someone at Riot and they were like, look, if we just ask the community, like what they want, they'd be like, yeah, I know Yasuo's wind wall should be like a cooldown of like two seconds, right? Yeah. And that actually doesn't make the game more fun because people obviously, even in Mm -hmm. a non-Web3 environment with a not open economy, really want to do what's best for them, right? And so fundamentally like league is honestly like one of the most incredible feats of balance right the yeah, fact that like this is. game has been out for like eight years and like it's like shit still working and yeah. new heroes and new champions are released all the time <laughs> jungle changes are made it's honestly fantastic right and so i think that um you know when you ask the player community like oh would i want this sword to have five percent crit or twenty percent crit most people are always going to vote what's in favor for them so mm-hmm. how are you you know, like you obviously grew up in Riot, right? Um, they do a fantastic job of managing mm-hmm. their community and they do it in a Web2 way. They simply go into a forum and they say, hey, community, what's up? What do you think, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, without building it into the protocol, there's no quorums, there's no like actual DAO voting structure at all. And that seems to be working pretty well, I would say. Yeah. Maybe you would disagree, but... Um, you know, how are you guys planning on doing that for, for Avaverse, right? Will there be this sort of like token voting structure? What do you think about, you know, re- initial reactions essentially to the dichotomy that I just presented? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we do want to get to the place where we have a, you know, more in or formalized token voting structure for the holders in place. But like, we know our token's not out yet. And it's like you said, you can do this successfully without the blockchain. And so you know, we're very active in the Discord. The whole team is there. Uh, we have a chat with our community and then as, like another chat with our with our holders. And they're very passionate and they have goes back to aligning incentives, but they they have the studios, for the most part, the studio's best interest in mind because it's also their best interest as holders now. Um, and so there is some balancing act that needs to be done between, you know, like sort of, uh, I guess, the general perspective of any one given player and, you know, coming from a place of their self-interest and also balancing that against our game design and, and game development experience and trying to find uh, the sweet spot there. But I think, I mean, and this applies to, I think, feedback in general, the, kind of regardless of how it's delivered or the content, as long as someone is being genuine, there's something there it, which is worth considering. And so they might not have said it or come from the right place, when they delivered it, but if they're being genuine, like there's something there to talk about and, and, and maybe the solution isn't what they're proposing, but it could be something else. And I think a lot of that is the art of building games and you're right. Riot uh, does that very, very well. Um, or, or 
well, I guess it would probably depend on the player, but I worked really closely for about a year or so on the, on the game balance team. Uh, and I've been in a lot of those conversations about patches and, and jungle nerfs and you know, balancing <laughs> between, you know, Dude, low, I want to go back to the low. So yeah, I got to go back to the uh, Sated Devourer. That's what I would like. That's my favorite era of League is Sated Devourer with Shivana. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. whoever got rid of that, they should be <laughs> cut immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's exactly my point, right? Is that like I might just want something because that's the way that I want it, right? And so I think for Web3, I think it's a big, a big challenge, right? Is because yeah. even when you look at some of the NFT projects that are happening right now, like only like 10% of the community is actually doing the voting, right? Yeah. And yeah. democracy isn't vote all the time. Democracy is vote when sure. politicians ask you to vote, right? Yeah. So it's not really when, it's not really, oh, this like u- beautiful utopian universe, in which case like, is it really that, is it really that different, right? And unless like the voting immediately automatically goes into the game changes, which I suspect it would never do, but I yeah. could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that comes to the approach. And, you know, I've, across Web3, there's different, uh, at least, approaches on paper of how this structure works. And I've read things about, uh, you know, uh, studios saying that the players can vote out the developer from the game if they wanted to. Um, like, <laughs> I don't know how that would work, but we're not that we're not going that far. We, like, leverage uh, voting and Google Sheets and feedback forms, like, you know, your traditional methods to poll our mm. community. Um, but mm-hmm. there's also this challenge and I guess another balancing act of building for the players of today versus building for the players of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I mean, we've had very candid conversations with our community about, you know, how we expand the ecosystem and, and the mechanics and features that we build, especially like on the free player side to get more players in. Uh, and that might be at odds with uh, any one individual's incentive, but I the way I like to approach it is that you know we need to also account for tomorrow's players to to build uh, for a much bigger piece of the pie, uh, which will then create more success for all of the community members, holders, uh, players uh, that are currently there. And so that's another kind of vector in which we're always thinking about how we build and scale our um, operations and product. And so you've mentioned these players of tomorrow. How would you say the players of tomorrow are very different from the players of today or even just like the Riot players, right? I assume that you've spent a lot of time like looking at the type and psychology and cohorts of of people who play League of Legends. Yeah. For Avaverse, sort of, you're you're also a competitive game, right? So I assume that maybe some of that psychology overlaps, but... I mean, you've been heads down in the Web3 space. You know, what is the Web3 consumer looking for that's really different than the Web2 consumer? I mean, that's a really good question. And like right now, if you were to compare the number of players that identify as like, you know, a Web3 gamer compared to, you know, your traditional gamer, right? It's like not... It's not much of a comparison, you know, 99% to one or, or, or whatever that looks like, right? And so building of for the players of tomorrow, you know, our goal is to onboard uh, more players into this type of gaming experience. Um, and you could call it Web3 Gaming, but it's, you know, what we often say, and I think this is on our website, it's like uh, we build games players love and own. And it starts with love first because like, those motivations are are the same, and and the players that have come into our eager system from other Web three games, uh, what they've really responded well to is like, hey, this is a game I enjoy playing, um, and I want more of these games in Web three. And I think those are the same uh, motivations that you know your Web two and your, your League of Legends players play. They want the social, they want the fun experience, they want a late night game with friends, uh, and they want to have incredible memories and stories uh, to be told from the experiences they have playing together. And, you know, our vision is to build that for them and then also empower them with agency own and ownership um, and uh, share in the value that they spend playing games that they love. Because at the end of the day, it's players that make games successful and it's the players that have made Riot successful. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're worth it. Uh, they're incredibly important, right? They're the, the huge piece of this, this, equation for why we build games. Gotcha. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's really interesting. I think there's such a variety of people that are pursuing Web3, but in different uh, 
levels of strength, right? And so I, yeah. think, I see, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, Eververse sounds like it's a very incrementalist approach, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not trying to build the, um, the dollar, you know, pin to, you know, the Ruan, right? Yeah. And build this like vastly open economy, which I have very strong thoughts on. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully we'll be doing uh, some materials on on how difficult that that actually is yeah. and, the, and, the, and to replicate the, the American monetary system. But it sounds like, you know, yours is mostly anchored in saying like, hey, there's a generation of players who want to be competitive, but they want to do it in a place where they where they own their assets, and this is what we're this is what we're going to provide, right? We're going to be that incremental stepping stone on yeah. the way to like full Web 3.0. Like you will hit us on your on your journeys there at the Web 2.2.2 or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah. And and as we scale up as a studio, we are going to be leaning and, and moving closer to you know on that spectrum to Web 3 with the token launch, tokenized game economy, the able to earn. Uh, NFTs in game, but it's like in order to do that successfully, like it comes back to the product and, and having a game players are excited to play, kind of regardless mm -hmm. of all that stuff. And so that's where our focus is. And I think the one thing that we're doing, uh, or or one of the things that we're doing, which is unique, I suppose, compared to maybe the, your traditional Web two space, is like we're building very openly uh, in front of our players uh, in in like a work in progress game, mm -hmm. and like we launched it very, very early, right at the same time uh, alongside of our NFTs. And that's because you know, I think coming from Web2, uh, it's important that the products and the features we launch are more about the products and features and less about the speculation and mm -hmm. the promise of what it will be. And so we launched the game at the same time the NFTs uh, minted. Uh, when we airdropped hoverboards to everyone for free, like they were able to race with them right away. I mean, we haven't done a land sale or sold anything that didn't do something in the game already. And so we're doing hand in hand with our community, with our players, feature by feature. Um, and I think if we were more of a traditional web two studio, we probably would be in stealth mode still um, sure. just waiting for that big reveal. And so sure. it's a, it's a more of a, um, it's a longer process perhaps. Uh, and there's a lot to, to build because we're also like managing this live service game, but like we haven't, focus too much on user acquisition because we're still like we're building the fun uh, at the product like level mm -hmm. right now with our players with our community and getting feedback so yeah that's really i think that's a really interesting thing that i think web3 has definitely done a lot more than web2 <laughs> and i think there's variations right you know yeah. there are a couple different types of studios in this world there's data oriented studios like azinga there's product oriented studios like riot and there's creative <laughs> studios like blizzard which is like Behind locked doors until it's ready, boys. Like, yeah. you're not seeing a wink of Diablo 4 unless it's yeah. ready for the BlizzCon show floor. Exactly. Um, and so I think that that's a, a very interesting balance because when you look at it actually from, you know, of course, we're now mm -hmm. like just, just pull, pull pivot. We're at Stanford, right? Entrepreneurs everywhere. You're taking yeah. advanced product launch, right? And when you think about like delivering your minimum vial product, you know, one of the worst things you can do is be in stealth mode, right? It's about iteration. It's about shipping yeah. your product out immediately, getting feedback, and you have to be, as an entrepreneur, willing to pivot, right? And so yeah. I think that's probably one of the cooler things about the Web3 development process has been just like the consistent contact with the community on the development cycles, right? And, you know, there's obviously a wide range of how much the audience is participating in making decisions, but they're mm -hmm. at least they're giving their reactions and and, and their feedback, right? Yeah, um, which totally. I think is just very, um, if it actually fits more, I guess, with the, um, Pro this, the classic like fine product market fit um, entrepreneurial mm -hmm. journey, maybe in like tech and SaaS yeah. and consumer and whatever else there is. Um, so it's fascinating, um, yeah. and so I read somewhere in your in your in your white paper, and this is mm -hmm. I think um, something that I would be interested in talking about. Um, you know, right now you've been talking NFTs, but Web two point two yeah. lighter touch with the blockchain. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere about uh, this lending mechanic that you guys yeah. are trying to thinking about inst installing, right? And mm -hmm. I would, was wondering if you could just share share more about it. Sure. Yeah. So we have a lending mechanic currently live uh, and it's been a pretty great feature for our players and for our community. Essentially, you know, we have a lot of holders uh, and some people have more NFTs than, you know, they uh, 
can play with or would choose to play with. Like, you know, maybe they have 30 characters. And so they form guilds uh, and they self-organize and they can lend the NFTs to uh, their guild. And then they can share uh, in some of the rewards that are earned in game with the play, with the people that are, have borrowed the NFTs. But we built the entire thing off chain. So with one click of a button, you can lend to anyone. They don't even need to say yes or no. Uh, you can just know that you just know their account number um, and you just ask them or, or if you're a dev, you know, we can see everyone's account number. And so it's like, if you Alex were like, hey, I want to check out the Avaverse. I'd be like, yeah, let me send you some NFTs real quick. Um, I can give them to you in two seconds. There's no gas. You can take them back. Uh, it's instant. And so, I mean, this mirrors you know, what we've seen in Axie and, and sort of this guild scholarship type system. Uh, but like everything we do is from the perspective of the user and the player and wanting to create a really smooth uh, experience for them. And so, yeah, we've built this off-chain system that, you know, you don't put your NFTs in jeopardy um, or, or custody risk, uh, by, but by trading them and, and storing them different places. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really well perceived by our players. Got it. Got it. Yeah, the lending thing is, is very interesting because I even think like, you know, when I was working on Hearthstone uh, mm -hmm. and re revamping, helping revamp the economy, you know, we're thinking about, well, how can we get new players to play when the costs of, um, you know, entering the Hearthstone universe are like fairly high? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like decks are not cheap, right? And yeah. so we thought about this sort of like lending mechanic of being able to loan out decks, right? But one of the biggest things that came up was just the aspect of cannibalization, right? Like, mm -hmm. are, what's going on with your, with your economy, right? Have you, you know, I assume that potentially people who just are just rotating maybe through hoverboards. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit more about the, the business uh, decision? Obviously, it seems best for the players. Wouldn't, wouldn't argue with that. But, you know, how do you balance, right? Um, you know, being best for the players, but also being profitable as a studio. Yeah, I mean, that's a really uh, good distinction. Uh, and, you know, lending and, and sharing uh, a hoverboard system or, or NFTs like hoverboards or avatars, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's really great for the players and flexibility. Uh, but, you know, we want to take that even a step further and give players an opportunity to um, even monetize that uh, through like a, a rental system and marketplace uh, mm. that is set up um, so that uh, players and anyone uh, can very easily, like, you know, say, hey, this rental of the NFT costs this amount of tokens. Uh, and then we as a developer can capture a percentage of that uh, transaction trade. Uh, and, and so it's more about aligning incentives across the board and creating systems that work for everyone so that they are able to, you know, get value out of their the game experience and but it all comes back to having a game that's really fun to establish demand, to bring in players into the ecosystem. Uh, and the, also the fact that we have a free hoverboard. So it's like, we're not creating this, uh, this um, sort of forced demand to get players into the door. And so that also changes motivations and how we build the incentives into the game as well. So mm. got it. And now I've got, I've got a I've got a difficult question for you on this uh, right. lending and secondary trading, right? I'm sure yeah. you saw the news about Magic yeah. Eden changing their yeah. royalty structure. Yeah. We also saw the news about Magic Eden declaring that uh, you can't actually enforce royalties at the protocol level, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think technically I'm not a, not an expert on that. I actually think there is some discretion as to whether or not you can or cannot. But mm -hmm. I think it seems like the majority of chains. Um, yeah or the, at least the primary ones that have been operating on, on the large scale right now yeah. are not enforcing royalties at the protocol level. And in fact, it's actually the marketplaces that enforce the royalty yeah. rate, right? Yeah. And so now there's been like a ton of blowback and it's like a huge deal, right? Oh, like mm -hmm. the ethos of Web3 destroyed, right? Because the idea is that you're going to recoup um, your on the secondary market sales, right? And so mm -hmm. for, for you guys, if you enable the lending and you enable that kind of that trading, right? Yeah. Um, you are hoping to see that kind of secondary royalty income stream, how do you react now to something like a Magic Eden change, right? Where they just move all the royalties down to zero. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think it comes down to, as game developers, building a system that empowers players to do the things they want to do easily and efficiently, and especially when it comes to the UX side uh, and ease of, 
onboarding, we want players to not have to leave the game to do any of this. Uh, and so it's like we can build the systems that are more convenient uh, for players to interact in the ways that uh, are designed and they're encouraged to do through the gameplay, the game design, the economy, and the mechanics, and then offer it to them where we have a little more say in, I think, how it's structured. Um, but yeah, if uh, players wanted to take their hoverboard and trade it on Magic Eden and not pay any royalties, I mean, that is sort of still the ethos of Web3 is they have the agency and the ownership over that asset and the ability to go and do that. Uh, and so. Yeah, it's like a, a double-edged sword almost because like that's what this whole system is all about, right? Empowering players to to uh, to have that sense of choice uh, with how they spend their time in games and, and what they do uh, outside of the game with those assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess it also, I think it probably makes it tough, right, for, for on the studio side, right? I think the perspective, you know, let, let's just put the players aside, right? There's two yeah. sides to this table. True. There's the people who make the games, the developer, yeah. and then there's the people that play them, right? And so yeah. I think, of, you know, a developer perspective that I've had is basically like, well, I could go and work on Apex or League or, mm -hmm. you know, Final Fantasy XIV, yeah. and I can get paid a ton because they can afford to pay me that because the value is not getting skirted by me going to secret marketplace that doesn't enforce secondary royalty fees. So, you know, as you're building, as you're building the studio, right? Um, you said that you grew from, from two people um, mm -hmm. to around, you said 20, 20. or so yeah. right now? Yeah. Um, you know, sort of maybe, uh, you know, how are you attracting that kind of the, the, that kind of talent um, to, to the studio? If, you know, maybe there's those like, you know, those those fears about um, yeah. profitability safety um, on the Web3 side for the developer, because you're basically kind of giving up the pie, at least. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I could be wrong on that. But I mean, um, in, the, in the, I guess, current uh, slice of what's happening right now in Web3, but Web3 moves very fast. Uh, and, you know, the conversations we're having now and what's happening now, I'm sure it'll be a different conversation in two months. Uh, and, and I really view it as an opportunity as well to build and solve and serve our players and engage them in a way that uh, aligns with the, the profitability of the studio, but also uh, the value generated by players. And that kind of goes into the token launch uh, and, you know, how we structure the game economy. Uh, mm -hmm. And but you asked a, a good question about how we attract talent, uh, and I believe that uh, to a certain extent, like we're all figuring this out together. And a lot of there's a lot of new ideas, uh, and there's a lot of very passionate and very smart people that are excited about the game application and what it means mm -hmm. for the future of games. And uh, you know, we uh, talked uh, earlier about uh, the last podcast, and there's a lot of. Yeah, uh, weighted and strong opinions, right? And so, very strong. <laughs> but the onus is on us as developers to prove it out and make it work. And 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 yeah, it's a challenge. But we're attracting people that see the potential uh, and are excited about the challenge. And you know, we've been successful in hiring from Riot and Blizzard and uh, Ubisoft and EA and, and putting together a really strong games team. Uh, and I think it's largely due to our approach of being a games first studio, um, and, and really focusing on the core gaming experience and creating a game player's love and then sort of working with that demand, right. For that, that players have in that ecosystem and in the game that they love in that economy, uh, and leveraging it in a meaningful way. Uh, where now our incentives are aligned between players uh, and developers and also to a certain extent investors too and people that are holding the tokens. And so then we can all win together. And I think that's the best outcome here. In terms of, you just mentioned the, the three groups, you know, you got your players, you've got your developers, <laughs> you've got your, the, you got devs, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I think like that, that relationship exists in, in AAA. It exists on any public company, yeah. right? Um but the, I think the investors in Web3 are a little bit closer to the game than they are in a I'm an LP and I invested yeah. and um, this, this situation. And, I, and again, I want to make a distinction between two types of investors. There's your speculators, the people that might hold your token or hold your NFTs for asset mm -hmm. appreciation. 
but don't play your game. Mm-hmm. And then there's like your back backers, right? You're that's yeah. for you guys. I believe that's Andre Sen and, and Play Ventures and yeah. and I think Dapper Labs or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, how do you think about parsing out the what the investors want and the player investor cohort wants? Yeah, I mean, I think what the investor wants is for the studio and the game to be successful uh, and creating success. Like it needs to be done in a sustainable way. And I think that's one thing I think we've all learned from, I guess, what you might call the first generation of these play and earn games is what's sustainable and what's not. Uh, and so with this, I would say maybe the next generation or, or what people like the revised versions, people are taking those learnings uh, and they're applying them and moving forward uh, is creating something sustainable that can grow and scale along with the player base. And I think that's what will make a studio successful. That's what investors want. And really that's what players want as well. And so like putting the, like aligning the incentives there is, we all sort of win together when when the game and the studio succeeds, uh, and so I think that's a unique relationship in this in the Web three type um, formula that you know your traditional Web two games are very top down. You know, investors, LPs, game developers or publishers down to players, um, and their players, like I said earlier, are the ones that make the, the whole thing work. So, got it. Um... And then I guess like, you know, like you're obviously building out your studio over time, mm-hmm. right? Um, you have just received your, your seed round yeah. um, from, from Andreessen and Play and others. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who are the people that you're looking to recruit? Um, what gaps does, uh, I guess, Battlebound as a studio have? You know, what's that critical linchpin that you guys are going to hit in order to basically bring Avaverse to a larger community of, of players? I assume everybody wants to grow right so (laughs) totally yeah i mean so yeah we just hired our 20th uh employee and so that was super uh great it was our first full-time animator i'm very excited about that hire and and the skills that they bring uh to the table and yeah we're we've sort of hit critical mass for the point right now it's like we're fully remote studio and i think anyone that is running a game studio knows sort of the amount of uh effort and, and energy that goes into organization and, and tuning the efficiency of a, of, of a company. And so uh, we're, we're in a good, pretty good place now. We have really exciting milestones. We have the team to execute on them. Uh, we are hiring a, a, a marketing director and go-to-market uh, uh, specialist, uh, which is interesting because like, you know, there's candidates that are great and a lot of Web3 experience, not so much gaming experience or a lot of gaming experience, not so much Web3 experience. Uh, so, you know, finding that right mix of skills. And I guess that goes for more than just marketing, but uh, it's very interesting. I'd say a lot of our team, uh, we've over indexed on the game side because we believe like without the core uh, fundamental game loops and, and, and fun game, then the, the other aspects don't really hold up. And so our team is very strong on the traditional gaming, um, free to play, competitive uh, game side, and 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 now we're ramping up and skewing more into the Web three side as as more products come online, and, and we look to push the studio more to that uh, tokenized uh, future. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and yeah, it's, there's going to be. I have to candidly say, there's going to be a lot of competition out there uh, against you guys. It was looking. <laughs> pretty okay in gen one with the axes and the, yeah. and the, and the Z runs. But now there's just a strong influx of other web three studios that are coming out of, you know, studios that have shipped and delivered titles before, you know, uh, and you, there's going to be that kind of talent race for the best kind of people. Um, you know, in that, in that regard, you know, I, maybe you can answer this from two questions, two sides, but if you had to convince, um, you know, a player to come play Avaverse over any other Web3 game, you know, what, yeah. would your, what would your answer be? I would say to, to, to just come try out the game and see if you love it. Like, see if it's something that uh, you're excited about playing. Uh, come bring your friends, play with friends. It's like... And also, like, jump into our Discord and, and hang out with the dev team, the community there. Because it's, like, it's an ongoing process, like I said. And it's, like, the vision 
the ultimate vision for where the game's going. Um, we are on tr on our track to to get there over time. And so, mm -hmm. like, if you want to be part of that process and you want to help shape it and you know be able to talk to extremely talented game developers about their thought process and join our Twitter Spaces, like, uh, it's available. And this is a it's more of a journey uh, as as we build this together. And so, if like that is that pulls you in, right? And and you're excited about that and having some ownership stake in the products and the features that we build. Um, we do have uh, an exciting uh, airdrop plan. Uh, that's all I can really say about it. So it's a good <laughs> opportunity to, to come and get involved. Um, so yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, it does sound like you're about to announce some exciting partnerships uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, game modes, it sounds like you've mentioned. So um, you know, want to keep people aware of, you know, the, the activity that's going on for, for Battleborn, um, as a studio and Avaverse as the, as the, as the universe. But, you know, I guess shifting onto the dev side, you know, there's a question that we like to ask people, um, at Stanford, uh, and we all have to kind of go through this, this legendary course, um, at school. That's basically about answering this essential question of, you know, what is your CEO superpower? You know, like, mm -hmm. why would people follow you? Um, yeah. And so I guess this is a question maybe for you, particularly in your background, but, um, you know, when you're looking to recruit in this extremely competitive environment, you know, what is your CEO superpower? Why do you think you have a team of 20 people that signed up and quit their cushy AAA jobs to go jump on this crazy Web3 thing? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, in talking from, you know, my team and, and people I've worked with and people that left Riot to come work with me. Uh, my personal superpower is just building games, A to Z. Uh, as a tech artist and as an artist, uh, I have very intimate knowledge of every step of the way of like how games come together and how to coordinate teams like working between artists and engineering uh, and getting them to speak the same language and ensuring that we are building a scalable pipeline and foundation uh, that lasts for the years to come. Uh, and we avoid uh, what is known in and, and the de de development trenches is tech debt, where we're, you know, we're <laughs> paying the price for the choices and shortcuts that we're making. Today. Like, as a technical artist, like that's uh, my bread and butter. And we kind of are the glue that slides, slots into the whole development pipeline uh, mm -hmm. to ensure things run smoothly. And, and we're building games in the best, most sustainable way and more efficiently. And so uh, I did that on League of Legends for four years uh, and, and I've been able to take all those skills and learnings and apply them. And a lot of the work that I did there is like directly contributed to the success and, and like where we are today as a company, as a studio as well. And so, um, yeah, I think that is probably my, my greatest strength is, is putting together the team and, and allowing things to, and empowering people to, to, to work smoothly and efficiently to deliver quickly and iterate and prototype quickly and go to market fast. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, the tech debt is a, it's a huge one, man. Uh, yeah. I don't want a tech debt at Blizzard, I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's honestly, it's almost it's almost unlovable and humorous in a way. Uh, I think that um, yeah, many people even experience this, even from building Excel models, honestly. Uh, when you build things in a shortcut kind of way that you don't future-proof anything that you're doing, it becomes really challenging to, yeah. to move forward. Um, and it's a thing that I think affects organizations, uh, to the core, no matter honestly, like what kind of software or, you know, engine that you're building. Um, yeah, very so, true. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, I want to, uh, ask a couple of fun rapid fire questions and then okay. maybe ask, uh, you know, uh, if there's any special exciting news that you want the audience to know about that has to do with battle, um, Battlebound, and then you know, I want to also say, like, give you some time to share what people can do to get in touch with you if, um, you know, they're inspired by your vision and sure. uh, want to be that marketing person that you desperately yeah. need. There's someone out there listening. Um, <laughs> All right, love but it. so I've got a couple of questions uh, in a, in a fun sort of way. But uh, you know, if you could take one game right now, right, any game in the world, and mm. port it over to Web three now, and same quality, same gameplay same art level, world design, narrative, et cetera, what game would that be? And which yeah. game, and why do you think it would benefit from the blockchain? Gosh, that is a fantastic question. And uh, like, it could be that like we are heads down building a shooter mode right now. And in the, obviously the leverage is Web3. And so the first thing that comes to mind is Overwatch. 
Um, and so, oh goodness! <laughs> what, what? Wasn't expecting that one. I know. You know like right? check out my Overwatch like, loot box on the back of. Yeah, I know. Ears. I see that. So, like, yeah. How does that work? Uh, and so, like, we're working on we're working on building a system where, uh, like, you think of a hero shooter, right? And it's all mm. about the heroes. Well, in the Averse, like, it's very avatar driven, and we have all these different NFTs. And so, like, if we could put the entire kit of a hero shooter on a gun. And then make a craftable weapon kit for that, where people are crafting millions of variations and able to mint the best ones as NFTs and trade them to each other. Um, like that's the space we're working in, uh, and we're really excited about that. And so, uh, yeah, that's the first thing that came to mind because, like, that's a uh, that's very much top of mind for the team in the studio. Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because there are so many projects right now in the Web3 space that are yeah. oriented around like farming kind of ecosystems and yeah. the MMOs, like the places right mm-hmm. for people that are trying to build the MMOs. But yeah. um, the, the the FPSs, there are some couple cool products that are coming up, but it's a, yeah. it's a space that I think a lot of investors, developers, even community people are like, well, does this work right? And I think I have a thesis that I've written about before, but it's there are certain genres that I think that lend themselves totally. better to being Web three games, right? Totally. And I don't know the FPS one. I'm you know I'm waiting to find out. Uh, excited yeah. about it, uh, but the FPS one is interesting. I have to yeah, say, I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's like you know Web three is not a solution. I think for every game genre, right? And so. Mm-hmm. It, it, it lends itself well to, to certain mechanics and, and play style. So it's really about leaning into those and the products that you build. Got it. Okay. Uh, very fun, very fun one, but um, you know, you're, you're a gamer, you've been a developer, mm-hmm. like almost, you know, since, since basically yeah. uh, your whole life. And uh, you know, if there's a video game world that you could live in, uh, what would it be and, and why? Oh, wow. Um, so I grew up playing Final Fantasy games. I love oh like the Final Fantasy uh, stories. And I am a sucker for more of like the medieval fantasy style of those. And mm. so I don't know, some of the older school Final Fantasies come to mind. It's just like worlds that I fell in love with. Uh, it's like Final Fantasy IX. Um, ah, got it. And, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Zidane? The, is that Zidane? Um, yeah. Zidane? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. 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 I'm so a huge. The, I mean, Probably living there, it'd feel more like Game of Thrones, and like it'd probably not be, <laughs> be, be as fun. Not like uh, you know, after thinking about it for a second, but like just kind of that, those visuals and the stories, uh, you know, just really entranced me as a kid, and really like affected you know how I approach game development and like I kind of why I, how I got into games mm-hmm. in the first place. So cool, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge pro for that. I'm a Final Fantasy buff myself. Yeah. As, um... I have a hot take. I think Final Fantasy 15 is an unfinished masterpiece, um, but no one agrees with me. That's fine. I stand firmly in my convictions. Um, but I think that I think it's cool. I mean, it's a it's a one of the things. The best thing about a, about game studios is they have that kind of heart and soul to them. And so it's a uh, you know an interesting, always interesting to hear what people people kind of say to that. Yeah. And then uh, finally, our this is a, a legacy question from the Nico era, but you know. You know, you're building a Web3 game. What's your what's your boldest prediction? Your total, the most red pill thing that you can come up with uh, for the future of, uh, of a Web3? Uh, you know, I honestly, and I mentioned this at the top of this conversation, I believe, but like, I think that right now people get really hung up on the concept of those words, right? Or those letters, Web3. And, and to me, this is a form of technology. And like, as it becomes more mainstream, I think that the words web three themselves, like just aren't going to be very important. Uh, and, and, and for this to be massively adopted by users, uh, like the, the form of, uh, crypto and blockchain and like the actual tech, uh, is really just going to disappear. And you like, like you look at the new iPhones, right? Like no one knows how it works. It's like the amount of people that actually know how it works. Uh, it's very, very small. And like, no one cares. Like they can just use it and do what they want to do in their day to day. And so like, maybe this isn't super red pill. I'm not sure. But I think as the industry evolves and the space grows, like it's going to just kind of fade away uh, and become like household and, and standard in the rec- respective realms. But it's not going to be this uh, huge, like, uh, um, like hotly, discuss topic like it is today gotcha well we're hoping yeah i think a lot of people are just gonna be like yep 
Web3, blockchain is going to power the backends and yeah. just the, the sheep of the world are just not <laughs> even going to know it. Um, and it'll be pretty cool. Um, pretty, you know, pretty bold, I think. Yeah. Bold but reasonable. <laughs> um, I think, I th yeah, some, some people have come up with some pretty uh, uh, yeah. offensive ones or, well, not offensive, but uh, yeah. outlandish rather. That's the better word. Um, but and then finally, you know, like how, how can people get in touch with you? Um, any exciting news that you want to share about Battlebound and what they're, what's upcoming in the next like month or two? Um, yeah. So, uh, LinkedIn is great. Get in touch with me on LinkedIn or, uh, Twitter at OP tech art. Um, so very, very yeah, on those channels a lot. And then, yeah, we have the cosmic cup, uh, racing mode, which we've been putting a lot of energy, uh, into as a studio as this next big game mode in the Avaverse, and we're very excited about uh, launching it. And so that's going to be coming out this year. Uh, mm -hmm. TB TBD on the on the uh, on the exact timing, uh, but probably a few weeks after this podcast airs. Uh, and like I said, now is a great time to to get in Discord to get involved. Uh, we have a lot of exciting features, partnerships, announcements coming down the pipe, uh, and and leading into early next year. So, got it. Nice. Well, that's Adam Hensel, guys, uh, the CEO and founder of Battlebound. So if you want to get in touch with him, like he just shared those news. And again, this is uh, at the end of another session of the Metacast Crypto Corner. Um, and we'll see you in next week or two weeks for me. But yeah.